Alrighty, linguistics chapter two, a brief history of linguistic thought. To appreciate the methods to appreciate the methods and assumptions of modern day linguistics, we need to understand how people have reflected on language in the past and what has motivated them to do so. For Aristotle, for example, analysis of grammatical categories such as gender, number, and case in his rhetoric serve primarily to illuminate a wider discussion of good style. Descriptions of non-European language were often compiled by missionaries seeking to spread what they saw as the word of God in parts of the world where European languages were not spoken. Emerging nation states promoted national standard languages, see chapter 12, and with them came the publication of prescriptive works which held up the usage of a social elite as the only acceptable norm for speech and writing. A brief review of linguistic thinking through the ages reveals some remarkably contemporary themes. The notion of arbitrariness, which underpins modern structuralist approaches, emerges in Plato's work. A 12th century treatise on Icelandic spelling, reform, shows a very modern approach to phonology and debates between rationalists and empiricists over innate ideas and universal universal grammar uh, find 20th century echoes in Chomsky's clash with the descriptivists who preceded him, as we will see in chapter eight. But the Lord came down to see the but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, "If anyone sp- uh, if anyone p- people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this." then nothing they plan will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Uh, so the Lord scattered them from from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. This is why it was called Babel, uh, or Babel, Babel, because uh, there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. That's Genesis 11, 5-9. The story of the Tower of Babel uh, in the epigraph above is one of many such myths in which confusion of tongues is seen as divine retribution for human hubris. Within such narratives, the natural processes of change to which all languages are subject are equated with decay, promoting the search for an original, uncorrupted, pre babylonian tongue from which all others are held to derive. See case study below. Uh, national language myth. Myths. Writing in the 5th century, Herodotus uh, recounts how Pharaoh uh, Sematius Sematius, Sematius, of Egypt has set out to discover the original language of mankind by ordering that two children should be raised in isolation by a shepherd who was forbidden to speak to them. After two years, the children's first word was similar to Bekos, the Phrygian word for bread. Uh, from which the pharaoh was forced to conclude that the Phrygians and not the Egyptians were the most ancient people. Okay. As Robbins points out, this tale has been recast with many different outcomes, revealing how the search for an original language is often suffused with nationalist ideology. The language of Adam has at various times been equated with Greek, Latin, or Hebrew, um, and, a, and a real or imagined association with an ancient language has often been spuriously advanced to promote the cause of a contemporary one. A treatise published in 1569 by the Dutch scholar Goropius Vassanus, for example, argued that the oldest language was Sumerian, traces of which he claimed could be found in the Brabantic Dutch dialect. In the same year, Henry Estienne published an impassioned defense of the French language, at that time emerging as a serious rival to Latin in France and a competitor, notably with Italian, for for international prestige, on the grounds of it being allegedly closer to ancient Greek than other European languages. Early linguistic scholarship. Early linguistic scholarship was often motivated by the need to preserve sacred and ancient texts for future generations. We we uh, we do owe much of our grammatical meta language to the description set out for Greek, uh, which was designed to facilitate reading of the Homeric text dating from around the eighth century. Our knowledge of the Sanskrit, likewise, der- derives largely from descriptions designed to preserve religious text from the Vedic period. In the Europe of the Middle Ages, 
the teaching of classical Latin uh, for liturgical purposes grew in importance as the Romance languages, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, moved ever closer, moved uh, rather, moved ever further from their Latin parent. Throughout history, debate has raged between two approaches, which might be labelled empiricism and rationalism. Very broadly, empiricists were and are concerned with the recording and analysis of observable fact of language structure as revealed in speech and writing. While rationalists seek to account for language in terms of innate abilities or ideas, linked to the latter is a concern with finding universals. I.e. features common to all languages rather than just to individual ones. Where the Port Royal grammars of the 17th century, see below, proposed universal linguistic categories on the basis of those found in the classical languages, the North American descriptivists of the 12th, 20th century celebrated the linguistic relativity, i.e. the view that each language conceptualize, conceptualizes uh, the world in its own way. The pendulum uh, was to swing back in favor of universalism with the publication of Chomsky's Syntactic Structures, in 1957, see chapter 8, heralding the emergence of the generative paradigm, which started from the belief that human beings are innately equipped to learn language, and that therefore, at an underlying level, all languages must be structurally similar. Uh, key idea, rationalists versus empiricists. Rationalists uh, linked language to innate mental structures, while empiricists denied the existence of these structures and saw language as moulded by sensory experience. A final important theme is that of linguistics as a science. The scientific model for linguistics uh, ha has, however, varied over time, from comparisons to geology or natural history in the 19th century, with its focus on regularities in sound changes, to an emphasis on mathematical descriptive rules in the 20th. Part of the requirement for treating linguistics as a science, as we saw in Chapter 1, was the language be studied on its own terms, in sources, words, and elmin, et pour elmin, uh, in itself and for itself. However, it ultimately proved impossible to view language in isolation uh, from other aspects of human life. Language variation, for example, cannot be divorced from social factors uh, as class or regional uh, origin uh, with which it correlates. <laughs> Part of speakers' unconscious knowledge of their mother tongue is clearly of a social nature. English speakers, for example, can make informed judgments about a person's regional origins or social background on the basis of his or her speech. Uh, the relationship between language and society is explored in the sub-discipline of sociolinguistics. See chapter 11 and 12. Uh, similarly, meaning cannot be properly understood in isolation from context, and the knowledge shared by participants in an interaction, which form the subject matter of pragmatics, see chapter 10, the emergent fields of psych psycholinguistics, neurolinguistics, and biolinguistics all attest to the interaction of linguistic study with other fields of scientific inquiry. Uh, while the branch of linguistics known as stylistics uses theories of language to illuminate the study of literature, classical and medieval linguistics. Greek linguistic scholars were profoundly to influence their Latin successes, whose thinking, as we saw in Chapter 1, exerts a profound influence on prescriptive English grammar even today. The achievement that was to have the greatest impact on Europe and the wider world, however, was the development of a phonemic uh, for writing system, i.e. one based on key sound contrasts uh, used by the language. As uh, early as the second millennia, a syllabic writing system, now known to archaeologists as Linear B, uh, was used by the Mycenaeans, and in the first millennia, set the first alphabet in the modern sense of the term was adapted by the Greeks from Phoenician script. The Phoenician alphabet, alphabet has consisted essentially of consonants, uh, uh, vowels, uh, which, it, which in sem Semitic uh, languages are largely predictable from word structure and context, do not generally need to be marked. See spotlight below. Uh, 
the Greeks introduced vowel symbols, uh, sometimes adapting them from Phoenician characters, Phoenician alif, uh, for example, which indicated a glottal stop, so chapter 4, eventually became alpha, uh, representing the a ah phoneme. Uh, the word alphabet is derived from alpha and beta, uh, the first two Greek letters. The alphabetic uh, system was borrowed initially by the Etruscans of central Italy and subsequently adapted to become the Latin alphabet, which forms the basis for most modern European writing systems. Spotlight. The ancient origins of text-speak. Given the consonants of the word root, KTB, an Arabic speaker can deduce the vowels and their positions from context and easily determine whether the word is kitab, uh, kitab, uh, or one of the cognates, katib, or kataba, uh, writer, and he wrote. Uh, this, this works less well in English and other non-Semitic languages, given BLDR, for example, is not immediately clear whether the word, word is bolder, bolder, builder, or even bolder. Uh, yeah. Four different words. And similar problems beset Greek. But it has often been pointed out there, even in English, sentences in which uh, the vowels have been omitted are still relatively easy to decipher. Uh, yeah, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog uh, with the, all the vowels missing in the example sentence, while those in which the consonants have been left out are impen impenetrable. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. This essential insight informs modern shorthand systems, conference interpreters, note-taking, and, of course, text messaging. Uh, uh, yes. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, written probably in the 8th century, held a quasi-scriptural status in ancient Greek education and Homeric scholarship from the 6th century onward shows acute awareness of how the Greek language has changed in the intervening period. Uh, the, problem of the problem of linguistic change is also explored in Plato's uh, Cratylus, uh, the theme of which is the fit between the essence of an object or concept uh, and its rendering in language. Socrates and the eponymous Cratylus himself argue for linguistic naturalism. Uh, the view that names or words b uh, belong naturally to the objects or concepts they identify in Cratylus' view, uh, these were laid down by the gods themselves, uh, though the connection between a word and its essence uh, may have become opaque as a result of linguistic change. The counterposition, conventionalism, is advanced by Hermogenes. Uh, he sees no connection between words and concepts, arguing that they have come about purely uh, as a result of convention. The naturalist uh, perspective of Cratylus in particular reflects a purely Hellenocentric worldview. The ancient Greeks were generally uninterested in languages other than their own, speakers of which were dismissed as barbaroi, uh, from which the English uh, barbarian derives. And the question of why, if words are divinely ordained, languages express similar concepts in so many different ways is simply not raised. But what is interesting about uh, this dialogue is the debate it prefigures about arbitrariness in language, uh, which will be central to Sassol's thinking in the early 20th century. See chapter 3. A grammatical description of the Greek language uh, was provided uh, by Aristotle, whose rhetoric offers a rudimentary uh, categorical description of Greek words into nominal and verbal elements. Together with a third class of functional elements he called in uh, and which included conjunctions, articles, pronouns. Uh, this was developed by Dionysius Rux in Alexandra, uh, whose Teshne Grammatique, uh, Art of Grammar, <laughs> uh, 
uh, set out the basis for the parts of speech of traditional grammar. His eight word classes included nouns, verbs, participles, and articles, but not yet adjectives at the stage these are seen to form part of the noun class. Later Roman writers largely adopted Dionysius Dionysius categories and applied them to Latin. Vero de lingua latina, on the Latin language, uh, composed in the first century, introduces uh, the notion of derivational and inflectional formation or morphology uh, in modern terms. Uh, See chapter 6. Christian's Foundation of Grammar, uh, written some six centuries later, presented some minor modifications to Dionysus' system, omitting, for example, the word class for articles, which Latin did not possess, and also addressed pronunciation and syllable structure. The continuing importance of Latin as a lingua franca throughout Europe for education, and more importantly, the Christian church, uh, ensured that uh, Priscian's work remained influential throughout the Middle Ages and beyond. See a case study below. Descri- the descriptions of other languages, Welsh, Irish, Provence, Provencal, uh, which appear in the early medieval period, uh, often based on Pris- Priscian's model uh, or a design to illuminate the study of Latin. Uh, Alfred says of his Latin grammar, composed around the turn of the 11th century, and believed to be the first grammar of Latin in, in a vernacular or low-status language. Uh, that, that it would serve as a good introduction to English, yeah, even though this is not its primary purpose. Case study. Charlemagne and the law of unintended consequences. History is littered with examples of top-down intervention in linguistic matters that have not had the desired effect, and there is none better and Charlemagne's disastrous attempt to reintroduce classical Latin to the uh, Car- Carolingian Empire over which he reigned from 800 to 814. Following the fall of Rome, spoken Latin had fragmented quickly into what became known as Romance varieties. Uh, by the 8th century, many of these had diverged so far from la- classical Latin norms that the laity could no longer understand scripture. Uh, uh, yes. uh, so the problem uh, was the most acute in the north, uh, where the priest's tacit response had been to align the pronunciation as far as possible with local vernacular usage to ensure p- comprehensibility. Fearing dilution of the d- dilution of the religious and linguistic unity of the, his empire, Charlemagne attempted to stamp out this practice, uh, decreeing that the mass must be delivered liter liter liter, i.e., according to classical Latin norms. These norms were not, however, well known in the the Carolingian Empire, so Latin scholars, among them Alsun of York, uh, whose Latin had always been a foreign tongue and therefore unaffected by ongoing changes in romance, were brought in from outside to school the clergy in classical Latin pronunciation. The consequence was a chaotic non-communication between clergy and laity. The crisis was partly resolved in 813, by a compromise reached at the Synod of Tours, uh, which allowed sermons to be preached in local vernaculars while insisting that the liturgy itself be conducted in cl- classical Latin. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Charlemagne's attempt to strengthen the position of classical Latin had had precisely... Uh, at precisely uh, the opposite effect. In historical terms, the Synod of Tours compromise represented the thin end of an extremely long wedge. Uh, the the diglossic relationship between Latin and the, and the vernaculars, see chapter 12, had started to leak in favour of the latter. The local vernacular is now fulfilling a function formerly reserved for Latin. The retreat of Latin would continue remorseless, remorselessly over the centuries, with one of these vernaculars, that of Paris, gradually usurping all of its main functions. This variety, known as Francais, or French, became the official language of the French nation that would later emerge. In the nation-states which de- developed elsewhere in the former Roman Empire, Latin would similarly, similarly be replaced in its high or H functions 
by standard varieties of other Romance languages, uh, Italian, uh, Spanish, Portuguese. Well, while much medieval linguistic scholarship starts from the teaching of Latin or bears the imprint of a Latin model, one 12th century work, which has become known as the First Grammatical Treatise, st stands out for highlighting the inappropriateness of Latin uh, as a model for other languages. The anonymous author, generally, generally referred to as the First Grammarian, sets out a compelling case for spelling reform in Icelandic, uh, for which he argues the Latin alphabet, as it stands, is ill-suited. And this is a quote from the 12th century publication, The First Grammarian, translated in 1972. I have composed an alphabet for us Icelanders, us Icelanders, Oh, God, spit it out. Um, I have composed an alphabet for us Icelanders as well. Both, both of all those Latin letters that seem to me to fit our language well in such a way that they could retain their proper pronunciation and of those that seem to, to me to be needed in the alphabet. But, but those were left out that do not suit the sounds of our language. A few consonants are left out of the Latin, as the Latin alphabet and some put in no vowels are left out, but a good many put in because our language has almost all sonants or vowels. Striking about this work, which was unknown outside Scandinavia until the 19th century, are the first grammarian's detailed knowledge of early Icelandic phonetics and his grasp of phono phonological principles, uh, which would not be fully developed until the 20th century. He proposed the use of diacritics uh, on Latin vowels, uh, symbols to mark contrastive features such as length and nasality, uh, and noted the distinction in Icelandic between short and long, uh, or germinate consonants, suggesting uh, the use of capital letters to mark the, le the latter. Uh, for example, capital P to represent uh, a double P, uh, yep. Uh, in, its, in its use of minimal pairs to determine phonemic oppositions, uh, that is the substitution of different sounds in the same environment to produce words with different meaning, uh, see Chapter 5. His approach seems very modern. Uh, and this is just another quote from the book. Uh, now I shall place these letters between the same two consonants. Each in its turn and show and give examples how each of them, with the support of the same letters and placed in the same position, makes a discourse of its own, and this way it gives examples throughout the booklet of the most delicate distinctions that are made between the letters. His examples were often humorous, and for the 12th century at least, occasionally racy. Um, I, that's Icelandic, so I have not learned Icelandic, so I'll probably butcher that. Those men are brazen who are not ashamed to take my wife from me. A similarly modern resonance is found in the work of the tw uh, thir 13th and 14th century. Modestai, uh, all speculative, speculative grammarians who began as languages other than Greek and Latin were becoming better known in Europe. Uh, to question the philosophical basis of grammar, Roger Bacon and others argued that grammar was universal and that differences between languages were merely superficial. The theme of universal grammar was developed further by Lancelot and Arnold in their Port Royal Grammar. Uh, uh, yep. First published in 1660, which viewed grammar as the product of innate mental processes. Uh, this rationalist position was rejected by the British empiricist philosophers Locke, Hume, Berkeley, who denied the existence of innate ideas and held that knowledge was a product of sensory experience. Uh, drawing on examples from Latin, Greek, Hebrew and the modern vernacular languages of Europe, but not beyond, the Port Royal Grammar presented the six-case structure of Latin noun declension uh, as a universal framework. 
realized in a variety of ways by different languages in the Romance languages, for example, much of the grammatical work, which has been done by Latin case endings, was now performed by prepositions. The belief in language as a window to universal logic or laws of reason, exemplified by the Port Royal Grammar, prompted a search for fundamental roots from which uh, words are derived. Uh, this led in turn to some fanciful or often unsustainable etymology, uh, exemplified, for example, in the work of Horn Tuck, uh, whose two volume, The Diversions of Pearly, was published in 1786. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carla note, notes that Tuck's tenuous speculations on the nature of the word bar. Uh, Carla, 1976. A bar in all its uses is a defense uh, that by which anything is fortified, strengthened, or defended. A barn is a covered enclosure in which the grain, etc., is protected or defended from the weather, from, from depre- the depredations. A baron is an armed, defenseful, or powerful man. A barge is a strong boat. A bargain is a confirmed, strengthened agreement. A bark is a stout vessel. The bark of a tree is its defense. The belief uh, that linguistic signs have a rational, rational basis, obscured by phonetic change, phonetic change, is, as we have seen, an enduring one. But it became increasingly untenable as the diversity of human language became better understood. It was not, however, until the 20th century and the work of Cicero, C chapter 3, that the essential arbitrariness of the sign family became a central tenet in linguistic thought. The age-old conflict between empiricism and rationalism, however, has continued in different guises to this day and finds new expression in the debates between proponents of universal grammar within the generative paradigm and their critics. Key idea, linking form to meaning. The quest for a fundamental link between form and meaning, obscured by language change, led to some fanciful etymologies. Uh, The prescriptive tradition. As new standard languages began to replace Latin in the nations of Europe, a flourishing market emerged from uh, 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 manuals of good speech and writing. This prescriptive tradition, over which Latin cast a long shadow, was especially strong in France and Great Britain. Uh, in France, battle lines were drawn from the 16th century between those who equated good usage with that of the social, social, yeah, social elite, the royal court, and members of an intellectual elite trained in classical languages who saw themselves as the proper arbiters uh, of linguistic correctness. The interests of the former largely prevailed, and Forgelard's remarks on the French language Le Marc sur la langue française, published in 1647, became a veritable Bible for social climbers anxious to learn the secrets of the good courtly speech. Uh, The book's preface is very revealing of the nature of prescriptivism. Uh, The usage of even a narrow social elite is found to be heterogeneous. Uh, Not all courtly uses, at least Usage is acceptable, uh, and Fauchelard is interested only in the healthiest part, uh, la plus saine parte, of the court, uh, which he does not define. His prescriptions are therefore based on circularity. Good speech is to be found in the healthiest part of the court, which itself is recognized by good speech, uh, and are both arbitrary and idiosyncratic. In a country hungry for, for prescriptive rules, uh, this mattered little. And many of Vaugelard's strict strictures uh, have been accepted as correct French ever since. Key idea of the Latin model. As nation states emerged in Europe, the need to develop national standard languages became keenly felt. Prescriptive linguistic works condemned all but the usage of a narrow social elite. Grammars of European languages generally followed the Latin model of Priscian. Uh, for which in many cases uh, they were unsuited. Uh, Many modern prescriptive rules of uh, English derive ultimately from Latin grammar. From the 16th century onwards, prescriptive works in Britain largely follow Priscian's Latin model. Uh, Bolacar's grammar for English, uh, for example, takes the eight Priscian word classes set out in William, William Lilly's grammar of Latin in English. 
and applies them to English. Their prescriptions of Robert Louth's introduction to English grammar and likewise informed by Latin, and even in 1795, uh, Murray's English grammar was arguing for three nominal cases, nominative, genitive, accusative, justified on the model of Latin, in spite of the fact that English, then as now, only regularly distinguishes nominative and accusative in pronouns. He saw me versus I saw him. Uh, while prescriptive grammarians of English are no longer as in thrall to Latin as they once were, uh, many complaints about bad English, as we saw in Chapter 1, start from assumptions about Latin, Latin grammar. Uh, Simon Heffer's Strictly English, that's a, the correct way to write, and why it matters, published in 2011, still condemns the use of split infinitives. Uh, though it also seems more relaxed than his predecessors about ending sentences with prepositions. Mm. Case study, grammar and morality. The preface to Murray's English grammar reveals the author's intention to promote the cause of virtue as well as learning. Uh, Murray was neither the first nor the last to equate good English with moral virtue, as these 1985 comments by Tebbit former Conservative Cabinet Minister demonstrate. If you allow standards to slip to the stage where good English is no better than bad English, uh, where people turn up filthy at school, at school, uh, all those things tend to cause people to have no standards at all, and once you lose standards, there's no imperative to stay out of crime. Similar sentiments expressed by Prince Charles, John Ray and Geoffrey Archer attest to the remarkable persistence uh, of such attitudes where, wherever what Milroy and Milroy have called the linguistic complaint tradition is strong. Across the Channel, attempts to reform French spelling were criticised in 1990 by Mitterrand, wife of the then President Francois Mitterrand, on the grounds uh, that they represented an unacceptable weakening of standards. Listening standards is a slippery slope. Once you've let things slip with spelling, uh, why wouldn't moral standards go the same way? Uh, Madame Mitterrand would no doubt have been horrified by the presidential uh, com communique uh, announcing her death in November 2011, uh, which, which contained no fewer than five spelling errors, provoking something of a media storm in France. Oh, it's true. Uh, 19th century philology. What finally helped break the hold of classical Latin in Europe was the discovery in the late 18th century of the Sanskrit scholarship of India. And notably, uh, uh, Panini, Panini's, <laughs> Panini's grammar of Sanskrit, uh, believed, believed to date from the 4th century, uh, which described the language of ancient sacred texts dating from some eight centuries earlier. Thanks to such codification, Sanskrit has, had remained, like Latin in Europe, high status lingua franca in India uh, long after it had died out as the mother tongue. Bloomfield <coughs> pardon me, describes Panini's grammar as the first example to Europeans of a complete and accurate description of a language based not upon theory, but upon observation, i.e. one unfettered by classical Latin or Greek models. Uh, it also brought to light some striking resemblances between Sanskrit and the more familiar language families of Europe, i.e. Romance language, Germanic, uh, example, German, Danish, English, and the Dutch, and the Slavonic, uh, the Russian, the Czech, the Polish, the Bulgarian, uh, and the table, as the table below demonstrates, these similarities were far too common and regular to be the result of mere chance. And, uh, just as there's a table uh, that reflects some Indo-European correspondences, uh, yes, uh, yes, comparing uh, languages and how these words uh, are uh, quite uh, similar uh, um, in form. 
Such correspondences could only be explained, argued Jones in a famous paper to the Asiatic Society in 1786 in terms of a common ancestor, which would later become known as Indo-European. And this is a quote from Jones in 1978, uh, sorry, 1786 rather, (laughs) dear me. Uh, The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, uh, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of verbs and the forms of grammar, uh, than could possibly have been produced by accident. So strong indeed that no philologer, philologer, uh, could examine them all, all three uh, without believing them to have sprung from some common source, uh, which perhaps no longer exists. There is a similar reason, though. Uh, there is a similar reason, though not quite so forcible, for supposing that both the Gothic and the Celtic, uh, though blended with a very different idiom, uh, had the same origin with the Sanskrit, and the old Persian uh, might be added to the same family. Okay, establishing links between languages of the Indo-European family became the prime focus of scholarly linguistic activity for most of the 19th century. Andrew, as Schlegel, Schlegel, Schlegel anticipated in his short 1808 work Über und Wischet zur Indo. I guess, yeah. Uh, on the language and were wisdom of the Indians on the model of natural history. And this is a quote from him. Uh, Comparative grammar will give us entirely new information on the genealogy of language, in exactly the same way in which comparative anatomy has thrown light uh, upon the natural history. Where biologists found similar physical features in a number of different organisms, they concluded that, in all probability, they had been inherited from a common ancestor. Uh, even where no direct evidence for an ancestor was available. Uh, to a similar vein, where philologists uh, working from historical written sources found correspondence between basic lexical items that were unlikely to have been borrowed, they posited a common ancestor in Indo-European. Uh, of course, no written evidence for Indo-European, widely believed to have been spoken for some 6,000 years, where it was available. But on the basis of regularities, between its descendant languages, explained in terms of sound, sound laws, a partial reconstruction known as Proto-Indo-European, or PIE, P-I-E, was, de- was developed. Uh, the best known example of such correspondences is Grimm's Law, uh, named after Jacob Grimm, uh, but uh, drawing on the observation of Schlegel, Kahn, and Rask, uh, which explains a number of correspondence between Latin, Sanskrit, and Germanic in terms of sound changes uh, from Indo-European. Uh, in some words, in many words, where Latin has P, the Germanic languages have F, uh, as in the example below. There's little uh, P, F correspondences in Latin and Germanic uh, table. Uh, note that the letter V has the value F for German. Grimm explained this in terms of pi, voiceless stops. P, T, K, becoming fricatives. Uh, it has the, some Germanic letters there. I'm not sure how they're pronounced. Uh, but not in Latin, Greek, or Sanskrit. Compare Latin, ca- canis, Greek, I don't know how you say that, kuon, uh, but German, hund, English, hound. Uh, related changes saw pi voiced stops, uh, B, D, G, uh, became voiceless, P, T, K. Hence Latin duo, but English two, Swedish tu, 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 From these regular patterns of sound change, uh, Fletcher developed the family tree model, uh, w- uh, which owed much to botanical classification methods developed by Linnaeus, tracing the parentage of living language back to Pi. Uh, one version of the Indo-European family tree can be seen in the following diagram. Uh, Proto-Indo-European at the top and then trickling down into many, many, many languages. Uh, yes, going down from Germanic, 
Slavic, Italic, Celtic, Hellenic, uh, Indo-Iranian, then it goes down all the way to modern English and to uh, modern languages. Key idea, a common ancestor. Parallels between Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek led philologists to posit a common ancestor, which was reconstructed from historical evidence as proto, uh, Proto-Indo-European. Family trees saw historical relationships between languages, but failed to account for the effects of language contact. The family tree model is a useful presentational tool which has been successfully applied to other language groups. For example, for example Eskimo, uh, Alut, Sino-Tibetan, Austro-Asiatic, but it is nonetheless uh, misleading in a number of respects. Firstly, it takes far too little account of language contact. See case study on the next page. The dotted arrow in the diagram above is an attempt to represent the very strong lexical influence of Norman French or Middle English, <coughs> uh, which belong to quite separate branches of the Indo-European trunk. Uh, the branching works well where there is a physical separation between speaker groups, uh, allowing varieties to develop independently, as in the case of Afrikaans and Dutch, uh, but, but in most cases, the picture is rather messier and its branches often confusingly inter- intertwined. The model also presupposes relatively homogeneous varieties separating into dialects, which appear at the end branches of the tree, ignoring the fact that all languages are internally variable. Labeling a single branch as example English suggests that a homogeneous variety of that name emerged first from which dialects were to branch off later. In fact, historically, the very opposite was true. The dialectal divisions were present all along. And the codified standard language we now call English emerged from contact between a number of them. Case study, meet the family. From the language family tree, it can be seen that English is genetically Genetically, uh, the use of this biological metaphor is common in describing the relationship between language. Part of the West Germanic branch, and that its closest relative is Frisian, a language spoken spoken in the northwest Netherlands, uh, which was recognised my which which has recognised minority language status and its own language academy, uh, Frisk Academy. Okay. The close family relationship between the two languages should not be taken too literally. They have diverged from each other considerably and uh, have had different contact histories. English vocab was hugely, hugely influenced by Norman French as a result of the Norman conquest of 1066. While the Frisian Frisian language has seen extensive uh, lexical borrowing from Dutch, but nonetheless, uh, close similarities to English are still evident in the following examples taken from the Virtual Linguist website. Uh, so there's just some example sentences uh, contrasting languages. The practitioners of comparative linguistics in the 19th century recognized that if their discipline were to be taken seriously as a science, it required testable laws and hypotheses akin to those of geology or physics. Uh, the neo grammarian hypothesis, which emerged in the uh, last quarter of the century, was very much a response to the perceived need for scientific rigor. The hypothesis held that changes to a particular sound uh, in a particular environment uh, simultaneously affect all cases where the environmental condition is satisfied. Sound laws were held to be exception- exceptionless unless some ex- such exceptions could be explained either by other laws. Berners' Law, for example, <sighs> explained a number of apparent exceptions to Grimm's Law, or by analogy, changes in one word form to match another, see Chapter three, uh, chapter 13, for examples. The best-known formulation of the hypotheses uh, is found in Ostoff and Brugman's Foundations of Language. And then this is from that. Book. First, every sound change, in as much as it occurs mechanically, takes place according to laws that admit no exception. Uh, that is, the direction of the sound shift is always the same for all the members of a linguistic community, except where a split into dialects occurs, 
and all words in which the sound subjected to the change appears in the same relationship are affected by the change, without exception. Uh, the, posi the position statement in what some have called the Neo-Grammarian Manifesto uh, have, have been often criticised, and uh, not always fairly. Evidence from Galeron's Gilleron, Gilleron's monumental Atlas Linguistic de la France, Linguistic Atlas of France, see chapter 11, painstakingly compiled in the last decade of the 19th century, seem to belie the neat, exceptionless laws Uh, of, of the neo-grammarians and led the author to conclude that every word has its own history. But the differences between the, these apparently opposed positions were essentially ones of emphasis. It is possible to observe the general regularities of patterns uh, of sound change uh, while acknowledging, uh, as the Kavat in the above quotation clearly attempts to do, the specific circumstance of individual lexical items. Uh, which may not have followed the general pattern. Okay. Um, where the neo-grammarians emphasized historical regularity, dialectologists stressed the micro-etymologies of individual items. Both, however, focused on changes which had already happened. Not until the advent of variationist sociolinguistics of the 60, in the 60s would change in progress be observed and found in some cases to be lexically diffused, i.e. affecting some sets of words before others, and in others to be influenced by sociological, psychological, and uh, or aesthetic factors, uh, adopted at different rates by different groups. We will examine their findings in Chapter 11. Key idea, sound changes. The neo-grammarian hypothesis held that sound changes were subject to law, the laws that applied uh, without the law that applied without exception in given environments. Okay, that is chapter two.